Morning, everybody. Go ahead. I'm here to uh, to review this uh, latest, or well, it's not the latest, but the, the second latest magazine. We're a little bit behind here, but this one is the March, April edition, and it features Lynn McTaggart, as you can see on the cover. Now, Lynn McTaggart could be quite um, known to some of you. Uh, she has instigated what she calls intention experiments, where groups of people come together to intend or concentrate on a particular outcome. So the outcome might be for an individual, for a group or for a situation around the world. And the outcomes that have, have be, been, um, that have, have come from that are things like restored health and peace in, the re in a certain region of the world. When she was writing a book called The Field, she had interviewed many world um, famous scientists. And when she wanted to extend her work further to um, see if she could measure some of these outcomes that she was imagining would, would come from the, this, these intention groups, she asked these scientists if they would help her design some large scale measurable experiments, which they did. Her first intentions were for small things like purifying water or um, measuring how much seeds might grow, uh, right through to lowering violence in war zones. All of those were highly measurable. She says that in all her intention experiments, which is about number about 35, the large ones, she says that 31 have been successful. And, and three of those who, that haven't, that was because of a, uh, a technical error. And one was because the intention wasn't clear enough. She describes intention experiments as secular group prayer. So that's an interesting one. Of spiritual prayer, she describes that as thy will be done. In other words, we surrender to God's will. She describes an intention experiment as, or an intention itself, as an attempt to design something in your life or part of the world. And in order for that to be successful, you need to have an attitude which is humble and you need to trust the process. She sees meditation and prayer on the one hand and intention on the other as, quite, as using quite different parts of the brain. Meditation and prayer, she says, still and expand the mind. Intention focuses it, so quite different. With intentions, if, if she says, if, if people want to try it, first of all, you have to be specific. If you're wanting more money in your life, she says, you have to work out how much you need. You don't say, I want to win the lottery because you might win the lottery, but you might only win $5. She also says that um, people can use intentions for negative purposes. And she says that Hitler was a very good example of that. She says in order to counter bad intentions, you need to send good intentions to where the negative energy is coming from, or you really need to deeply listen to them to diffuse that negativity. Now, I'm reminded that a few years ago, we actually had uh, a Lynn McTaggart type group studying one of her books, which was The Power of Eight here at Unity of Melbourne. Um, I wasn't part of that group, so I can't speak to it. But I will read you the results of one of her Power of Eight groups, which she thought was quite wonderful. One group chose a woman called Maya, who was in a motorized wheelchair, paralyzed from the neck down. After the intention, when I asked who wanted to share, Maya's group urged her to talk. So Maya slowly looked around, got up on her feet, and then stood there and told her story. When somebody tried to help her, she said, I don't need help anymore. We were all in tears. But here's what's so interesting about Maya. She said the amount of love people were sending her was overwhelming. 
and this is from a small group of eight. She thought, I don't need all of this. So she sent some, of the, some to a relative with cancer. At that moment, she said, it felt as if the wheels of her wheelchair were going down into the floor while she simultaneously was being raised up. She knew at that moment that she was healed. That's one of um, Lynn McTackett's direct um, experiences in one of her groups. Now, when I was um, thinking about Lynn's groups, I was also reminded that other groups around the world have used similar sort of techniques, if not necessarily scientifically uh, measured. And one of those is, was at Findhorn at the very beginning of when they were forming the community. So they didn't actually have a community at that point, but the, the um, founders who were Peter and Eileen Caddy and Dorothy McLean were um, doing what they call their inner work every night. So every day they would work physically quite hard then they would um, have dinner, put the boys to bed, and then they would concentrate on their own inner work. And Eileen, who was very gifted in receiving messages from the divine, um, was instructed that they were to connect with various magnetic centers around the world. And she writes, one was a group of businessmen in Turkey. I saw them quite clearly dressed in formal suits around a central figure. I had a vision of a group in Holland that was in some way connected with the Dutch royal family, another group in Siberia and another in South America. I also connected with Aborigines in Australia and Bushmen in the Kalahari Desert in South Africa. They were told each of them needs, each, each of these groups that they had contacted, each of them needs to feel part of the whole. This is a network of light, therefore each should be linked. Now it's interesting they call it a network of light because this is in the days before the internet. And if you think about the internet, it's like millions of little lights out there around the world. And they had already started their version of this sort of work. As Peter read out the names of the centers each night, we tuned into each one to radiate out our love through the heart or light through the center of the forehead, depending on what we felt, felt the particular center needed. So that's intention groups. Now, another article in this month's magazine is by a lady called Dolores Huerta. Dolores is actually the aunt of a unity minister who writes for these magazines. She's 90 years old. She's a civil rights leader and a labor activist. She's also co-founder of the United Farm Workers Union. When, when Obama was um, in his presidential race, he used the slogan, yes, we can. Now, yes, we can comes directly from Dolores. She had been using that slogan for some many years. She also worked with Robert Kennedy and was standing beside him when he was giving his last speech and assassinated. She has led a 340 mile walk across the United States, a walk of protest for the United Farm Workers Union. The consequences for Delora for this work have not always been positive. In 1988, when she was part of a peaceful protest march, she was beaten with a baton, breaking two ribs and rupturing her spleen. Nevertheless, she has amazing stamina and energy and will spend a night dancing all night after a full day's activities, meeting with activists, traveling across the USA, giving speeches. In 2012, uh, Obama awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Now, for those of you who are interested in Peter Bolland's columns in the magazine, he's, he's the philosopher. He, this, this month um, concentrates on the hero's journey from the work of Joseph Campbell. And it goes through the different stages of the hero's journey. 
it's had me thinking, I wonder when we're going to hear about the heroine's journey. I imagine that would be rather different and just as worthwhile. And finally, on the Unity Masters page, it features a Unity Minister called James, James C. Lewis. He wrote several books such as The Mystical Teachings of Christianity and Biblical Favourites. He said in his last interview before he died in 1991 that he was troubled by Unity's drift away from Jesus and the Bible, but I mean he was still a, a staunch Unity follower. And that is the magazine. Thank you. Well, that's great. I always look forward to that. Thank you very much, Diane. And yes, uh, we do remember we had uh, we had the Lynn McTaggart group. I think, Leslie, you were part of that, weren't you? 